Hi, everyone. Welcome to our eighth 2023 Giller Book Club. My name is Daphna Rabinovich, and I'm going to be your host for tonight, as well as the remaining six book clubs, only six left. So please make sure to have your Zoom on a side-by-side -side view for the best possible experience. And it is my delight and my privilege tonight to, inter to introduce you to our interviewer, Rachel Rose. Rachel is the author of four collections of poetry and a memoir, The Dog Lover Unit, Lessons in Courage, Courage from the World's Canine Cops, which was shortlisted for the Arthur Ellis Award for Best Nonfiction Crime Book in 2018. She is also the recipient of the Bronwyn Wallace Award for Fiction from the Writers' Trust, the Pat Lowther Memorial Award, a 2014 and 2016 Pushcart Prize, and a 2016 nomination for a Governor General's Award. Phew. Rose's work has appeared in numerous anthologies and publications, and she was long listed for the Scotiabank Giller Prize in 2021. She now lives in Vancouver. And tonight, Rachel will be interviewing Sheila Hetty, author of the 2022 long listed and wonderful novel, Pure Color. During the next hour, please feel free to submit your questions during using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. And I will now happily hand it over to Rachel and Sheila. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daphna. And hello to everyone and welcome to the Giller Book Club and a huge warm welcome to Sheila Hetty. Let me tell you just a little bit about what a marvel Sheila is. Sheila Hetty is the author of 10 books, including the novels Pure Color, Motherhood, and How Should a Person Be? She recently published her second children's book, A Garden of Creatures, illustrated by Esme Shapiro. In early 2024, her book, Alphabetical Diaries, will be published. The book, which was excerpted over 10 weeks in the New York Times, has been optioned for a TV series by Hulu. This fall, Sheila is in residence at Yale as a Frank Visiting Fellow and as Associate Research Scholar and Lecturer in Religious Studies. Sheila was named one of the new vanguard by the New York Times, a list of 15 writers from around the world who are shaping the way we read and write fiction in the 21st century. Her books have been translated into 25 languages. Motherhood was chosen by the book critics at the New York Times as one of the top books of 2018, and, a, and New York Magazine chose it as the best book of the year. How Should a Person Be was named one of the 12 new classics of the 21st century by Vulture. It was a New York Times notable book, a best book of the year in the New Yorker, and was cited by Time Magazine as one of the most talked about books of the year. As well as being long listed for the Giller, Pure Color is the recipient of the 2022 Governor General's Literary Award for Fiction. I could go on and on, but I'll stop there to let us begin our conversation. I'm, yeah, I'm so excited to talk with you, Sheila, and I just so enjoy the strange trip that was reading Pure Color. Um, before we begin, I have I have many questions, but I just want to say how much your work speaks to me and makes me think, and that you write like like no one else writing today, and no one that I've ever read. Oh, and, thank, you. <laughs> thank you. I always say so when I'm talking to writers or interviewing writers um, that if there's a question I ask that doesn't you know spark joy, you don't have to answer it. It should not be agonizing, and we can just move along to the next one. So. Um, there's no obligation and I hope as much as possible that we can have a conversation as if we were sitting in a cafe together just talking and then of course we'll be hearing from the audience I'll be asking for them to put their questions in and tune in around 7 40 so does that sound all right yeah that's great the, the Marie Kondo method of interviewing <laughs> that's exactly it yeah so how's Yale Oh, that was, I, I got to take that off my website. That oh was a lot of fun. <laughs> but I, it was, how I was Yale? <laughs> yeah, I really enjoyed it. Um, I taught a class with a, a good friend of mine, Noreen Kawaja, who's a, a philosopher in the religious studies department. And one of, one of the people that I feel very lucky to know um, in my life right now, just somebody very interesting to talk to. And so this class that we were teaching kind of felt like an extension of the conversation we were having with each other, which was just 
it's sort of perfect. Um, and yeah, it was fun. I mean, uh, it was three months away from home. So that was a long time to be away from my partner, but, um, I brought my dog and we took long walks and it was, it was a nice break from, from life for a while. I bet it's so good that you could bring your dog. Yeah, when, very important. when we, we lived for a year in France and Italy and, uh, with two of the, two of the kids and the dog came too. So she's very <laughs> small. So she went to, you know, to Venice and she went on the train with us everywhere. And yeah, that was great. Yeah. Um, let's see. So I wanted to ask if you could tell your, uh, us very briefly for, for people in the audience who haven't read it, what Pure Color is about. Um, it's, it's sort of a rethinking of the, the, the creation of the world and why it was created and why and how it might end. And then within that, it's the story of one person who's living in that specific world, which is ours, but um, a, just a way of thinking about ours. Um, her name is Mira, and she goes to critics school to learn to be an art critic. And midway through the book, her father dies. So it's about sort of her relationship to grieving and to her father and this woman named Annie who she falls in love with when she's in school and the book sort of takes place all through her life but it's a very short book and so and the parts that are sort of focused on are her youth which is kind of before the internet and then um, a, a, a number of years later when her father dies and then sort of years after that and it, it's sort of when she's in middle age and it's kind of reflections on youth and middle age and um, mourning, love, everything in between, <laughs> <laughs> beauty. Yeah. Um, so I, I recently read uh, Pure Color, but I've read uh, several of your other books and I also enjoy, I confess, I enjoy reading self-help books, everything from Brene Brown to Susan Cain's Quiet or Malcolm Gladwell. And it struck me as I read your earlier books in this one too, that that you also write a kind of self-help, kind of you know philosophical or, or literary self-help. And I, I don't say that to be reductive because your books are so much more than that. But in your work, you, you ask that we grapple with the big questions like how should a person be or how should a person nurture and love and mother and write? And then in Pure Color, how should a person grieve? So I'm wondering what's your own personal relationship to self-help or to books that tell readers how to live a good life and do you read them um well when I was writing how should a person be I was reading them a lot and especially this one book called self-help which was the first self-help book I guess um when was it from the late 1800s I suppose and it was where that term was coined um and the way that you help yourself in the early self-help books is you read biographies or caption biographies of sort of the greatest men who ever lived and try to emulate them and so self-help sort of started off as very non-psychological just sort of imitative um and I guess it turned into something different with like new age philosophy and spirituality as being really about how to be the best you rather than, you know, the best version of Thomas Jefferson or whoever you could be, um, whoever you modeled yourself on. And so it's, I find self-help interesting today or, you know, in the last 50 years, because it's trying to become an ideal version of oneself, but without a model um, for what that ideal looks like or could look like. So it's 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 this strange thing that the book that self-help books are asking of people, you know, to be the best without having an image of what that actually is. So I, I find self-help a very interesting genre. I think a lot of mediocre writers somehow find their way into that genre, but it's really exciting when really great writers do. Um, hmm. I I think that it can be you know and 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 so much early philosophy is could be thought of as self-help like the stoics and so on um, yes I, you know. I read uh, the stoics again during the pandemic that was very helpful I mm -hmm. love actually what you said about um, the early self-help uh, was not this psychological model and that that dovetails very nicely with my next question 
um, which, uh, okay, so um, in pure color, I was curious about when you wrote, and I'll just quote, what you want are fixers, but what is needed to, is to follow the traditions with faith. You want people to come in and fix things for you to show you what the fixes are, but what is needed is to follow the family traditions. And then on the next page, you wrote, the fixers are coming from the world of psychology, from those who know nothing about the traditions and don't care and would smash them if they could. And I found that both curious and moving, kind of maybe a, a Jewish household therapy. You just get together for meals and follow <laughs> the traditions and healing will come from the act of doing that. And, and the fixers don't help you, right? They cause harm. The traditions have all the wisdom we need to guide us through grief. And I wonder if you can talk a bit about that. And actually you already maybe started it with talking about the earlier self-help, which where you emulate somebody wise who's living an ideal life versus self-help now just trying to focus entirely on yourself yeah that that passage um is sort of from the father's voice and the father is so it's his philosophy or his injunction to the daughter you know and right. i think that We'll get to this with the part that I read, but as a bear, as a very family oriented kind of person, um, yeah, for him, the psychoanalysts pull you away from your intimate relationships because they introduce critique and criticism and skepticism and barriers and so on. Whereas the family traditions, like as you say, the 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 dinners, the Passover dinner or whatever that brings the family together in a in a way that's not about psychology and not about your individual relationships it's just about tradition and I guess in Judaism the most important thing is following the laws you don't have to understand them and understanding comes if it does potentially from following so the most important thing is to follow the rules and then yeah, and then maybe you'll understand them because you follow them. You don't even have to believe them. You just do no. it. And so maybe there's a parallel between following wise people that we wish we could emulate, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. And when you follow, then you learn why they did the things they do. You know, if you can just imitate a good person, perhaps you can become good that way by feeling the feelings that a good person has by making the choices that they make maybe you see oh by not lying i actually feel closer and better to you know closer to people better in relation to people yeah but it's it's really not the way that we think about being good today by imitation or, or self-help right yeah right. yeah oh i really like that thank you i i was jotting down little notes as you <laughs> spoke thank you that's so great um, I wonder if if you would read for us now, and then we can jump into more conversation about the critics, maybe starting from page four through around page seven. Sure. Yeah, so this is starting as sort of the second page of the book. Right. Um, but I don't think you need the first page to understand the second, <laughs> third, fourth pages. So here we go. Thank you. Um, okay. Now the earth is heating up in advance of its destruction by God who has decided that the first draft of existence contained too many flaws. Ready to go at creation a second time, hoping to get a more right this time, God appears, splits, and manifests as three art critics in the sky. A large bird who critiques from above, a large fish who critiques from the middle, and a large bear who critiques while cradling creation in its arms. People born from the bird egg are interested in beauty, order, harmony, and meaning. They look at nature from on high in an abstracted way and consider the world as if from a distance. These people are like birds soaring, flighty, fragile, and strong. People born from a fish egg appear in a flotation of jelly, and this jelly contains hundreds of thousands of eggs, where the most important thing is not any individual egg, but the condition of the many. For the fish, it's less any one individual egg that concerns them than that the eggs are laid in the best conditions where the temperature is most right and the current most gentle, so the majority might survive. For fish, it's the collective conditions that count. A person hatched from a fish egg is concerned with fairness and justice here on earth, on humanity getting the temperature right for the many. 
1,000 eggs are the concern of a fish, whereas the person hatched from the egg of a bear clutches one special person close, as close as they possibly can. A person born from a bear egg is like a child holding on to their very best doll. Bears do not have a pragmatic way of thinking in which their favorites can be sacrificed for some higher end. They are deeply consumed with their own. Bears claim a few people to love and protect and feel untroubled by their choice. They are turned towards those they can smell and touch. People born from these three different eggs will never completely understand each other. They will always think that those born from a different egg have their priorities all wrong. But fish, birds, and bears are all equally important in the eye of God. And it wouldn't be a better wor world if there were only fish in it. And it wouldn't be a better world if there were only bears. God needs creation critiqued by all three. But here on earth, it is hard to believe it. Fish find the concerns of the birds superficial, while birds are made impatient by the critiques of the fish. Nothing makes a person feel like their life's work or their self is less seen than when it's being judged by someone from a different egg. Yet birds should be grateful that someone is making the structural critique so they don't have to. And fish should be grateful that someone is making the aesthetic critique so they can focus on the structural one. God is most proud of creation as an aesthetic thing. You have only to look at the exquisite harmony of sky and trees and moon and stars to see what a good job God did aesthetically. So those born from the bird egg are the most grateful of all. Those born from the fish egg are the most upset. And those born from the bear egg aren't too happy either. Perhaps God shouldn't conceive of creation as an artwork the next time around. Then he will do a better job with the qualities of fairness and intimacy in our living. But is that even possible? for an artist to shape their impulse into a form which is not, in the end, an art form. It goes on, but I think I'll stop there. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. It's so interesting, that idea. You know, I, I found it mm, so compelling, and I know I, I sort of took it and ran with it like a, like a horoscope, and I was thinking, well, perhaps you can divide writers into these categories as well. Um, you have, you know, the, the fish writers are the, the, the activists and they're writing for systemic change. And, and then you have the, the philosophers who are the birds and, and you have the, the bears who are the poets and the romance writers. And they're really interested in the particular heart and the particular individual story. And I know that's not how you intended it, but it just spoke to me so beautifully as if you are, well, you are creating a new myth, a new way of, of looking at the world. And yeah, maybe could you talk a little bit about how that came to you, where it came from? Yeah, I mean, it took a lot of thinking. <laughs> um, it didn't really come spontaneously at all. Um, I mean, I was trying, I, ha I had this thought that, yeah, God is three art critics in the sky. And I had that thought for like 15 years or something. It was just this weird sentence in my head. God is three art critics in the sky. I came up with it when I was, or came to me when I was reading, when I was writing, how should a person be? And then, yeah, around the time that I started writing Pure Color, I well, I would come back to it per periodically over the years and think, what does that mean? And then, you know, what would, why would there need to be three? And if there are three, how are they different from each other? And, you know, what is one of them? What is the other one? What is the other one? What's this Trinity, you know, so to speak? And I think, I can't remember, but I, I think come, I just through a lot of taking notes and writing and thinking came up with this idea of the bird and the fish and the bear and their different, the different arenas that they attend to. And, um, you know, part of it was a reaction. I was writing it sort of during the Trump years and part of it was a reaction to a lot of artists I knew thinking and feeling like art wasn't important, that only political action was important. And I, I I really disagreed with that. I think that art is always important and political action is always important um, and that they need to sort of happen at the same time always. And that possibly certain people are better cut out for one kind of action, healing, goodness, care in the world and than other people. Maybe the artists are gonna make a mess if they are suddenly become politicians or political. Maybe some of them aren't, but some, maybe some of them will, you know? and and. And I think doing it just because you feel like art is no longer important in the world is 
probably not a reason to switch lanes. So it was a way of just saying like, it's okay to be an artist and it's okay to feel compelled to attend to the care of the world in the way that you're naturally suited to. Yes, uh, that that struck me deeply. And I was also moved by um, the, the part where you write, where Mira is longing to be what she is and she's longing to be a bear, to love mm -hmm. her father as she was loved by him. And I know that Mira isn't you, though maybe you are related. In other interviews, you've you said that you live more and more for art and find your life's joyful meaning in the world of art. So maybe I was thinking, maybe you are a bear in a way and art is your one true beloved and you're already holding it in your arms. And I, I found I could so relate to the frustration of being the one thing in, in the philosophy that you laid out and longing to be the other. And I also loved that there's a place for each of them and each of, each of them together creates what is necessary and beautiful. I think and that's so important. Yeah, they all together create the world that's, and they're all necessary and beautiful. And the idea that they can't love each other in a way that is satisfying to any of them. So like Annie, who's a fish, who's Mira, the one that Mira loves, is always can't really return Mira's love because Mira's a bird and Annie's a fish. And how does a fish and a bird love each other? You know, and same with Mira and her father who are also two different species. And it's interesting. I just, I was on tour in Italy for this book just a couple of weeks ago. And I don't know why, but I was, I, I thought of asking the audience, I'd not done this before, like, you know, if they could identify which they were, I mean, it's just a game really, you know, but then they did. And then oh, I asked, wow. <laughs> and then I asked them like, whether they loved the person that they loved was the same animal as them. And for the, none of them was that the case. They all loved somebody from who had that different um, form of love towards the world than they did. The same is true of me, always has been. And I think that's funny that, you know, maybe there's something interesting about the couple, like that the two two people sort of need to be different from each other so that the whole world, the ecosystem of their world is taken care of. Like I sometimes think like maybe that's why we're so different often from the people that we love because all these differences come together to 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 create a new world, you know? Um, and if you're too similar that the then the world that you create is too small really or or it, it doesn't have enough um I'm just like thinking of yeah. like arrows going out <laughs> so much so you know I I found okay so <laughs> I love that you asked the audience I I was reading and I was thinking I'm a bear but I don't want to be just a bear you know I want to be a bear bird bear bird hybrid why can't I be you know and I'm married to a bird I I would say and um, then I thought, well, why can't more people be hybrids? But I think you maybe are one thing more than most. And maybe that longing is your shadow side or something like that. Um, but anyway, I just that idea speaks to me so much. And um, I was wondering, I was wondering a little bit about uh, why why you felt that longing to be something other than you are since it seems that you've created this beautiful life as a writer and critic for yourself I mean only you know Mira longs to be a bear because she wants to return her father's love um like her father loved her so tenderly and so in you know so personally and and she loves and people and loves the world through making art and reading and it just feels like not giving back what she was given that's really it and that if she's a bird you know then birds don't really love with the same kind of warmth they they right. love books they love art they love making art they love making books and that's that doesn't really go directly to the people one is closest to in fact it most often sort of skips over them and goes to the people farthest away you know it's a way of loving people far away from you right but it's still a way of loving it's yeah still a way of loving but, yes, but the people yes closest I... to you don't really get the effects of it yes I see that I see that 
Oh my goodness. Um, so you're an author as well as a cultural critic, and I, I don't see too many who wear both of those hats in Canada. After being long listed for the Giller and winning the GG for Pure Color, I wonder if you have a different sense of your relationship to your readers in Canada. Some Canadian writers have to leave the country to find their audiences, and then they receive belated recognition in Canada. Would you say that's been true for you? And would you say that you belong to a particular country as a bird, as a <laughs> soar, soaring above? Do you feel bonded to a place? I mean, I, as I, the older and older I get, the more I understand myself as Canadian, but I don't think I did when I was 25, you know? I think that I, and, and, and certainly at the beginning of, my writing life, it was American editors and publishing houses and critics that responded to my work and the Canadian, um, th there just wasn't as positive a response towards my work here. So I felt much closer to American culture, but um, but I, I, I wouldn't at this point in my life want to live there and I'm happy that I live here and I, I, I I'm happy I live in a country that has like, you know, healthcare for everybody and that, that, that is not such a selfish place really. And that, you know, takes, takes care of people a little bit better. Um, I don't know that my writing is a reflects Canada. I don't, but I wouldn't say that my writing reflects America either. I kind of feel like authors, uh, of course, you know, there are authors who really do write from a sense of national identity, but I, I think a lot of the ones that I connect to most don't. They just write from a sort of more um, universal or personal or I'm not sure. Like I'm just thinking of, I mean, obviously, obviously it's complicated, but yeah, I don't know how to answer that question exactly. No, that's okay. Maybe I'll, I'll ask um, one that's slightly related. Um, who who are the cultural critics in this country that um, that maybe inspired you when you were starting out as a writer? And it, it doesn't have to be just this country. And what would you say is the role of the critic right now in this time and place? I mean, you know the fact that everybody can have their sub stack and everybody can have an audience, I think is really good for criticism. It makes it very interesting. You know, it's, I, I prefer that to what it was like before the internet when only very few people had a voice that you could hear. I think this is much, it's, I, I like, I love the culture wars. I love the debates, the really serious debates that people have about um, everything <laughs> that has to do with culture. I love following those. Um, you know, when I was younger, the when I in Canada, you know, there was and still is this gay, um, um, I guess, pornographic film maker named Bruce LaBruce, who would write a lot of articles as well. I really liked his, I really liked him. If you want to talk about cultural critics, um, LaBruce, Bruce LaBruce, um, taking notes here, <laughs> <laughs> um who were the cultural critics that I liked? I don't think that I was somebody that was that current on the culture. I mean, I, I was very happy to go to a university, the University of Toronto that had um, Marshall McLuhan teach that, you know, like, um, uh, and, and um, who am I thinking of right now? Um, it's the worst question, isn't it? Literary to critic. Um, <laughs> I can't remember his name right now. I have him here on my shelf. It'll it'll come back as we're yeah. As we're I don't getting. know. I I feel like the stuff that I read sort of just becomes part of me as soon as I read it, and then I I forget the details and the names. It just kind of get absorbs into my my blood system, my blood or something like that. Yes, like a sponge. I'm just curious. You know what shaped you? Did you grow up in a a literary household, or how did you? How did you become this this critic and thinker? You know, I was reading about your protagonist Mira and how she went to the Academy of American Critics, and I don't know if that might be something that you did as well, or if it was an imaginary place. And uh, 
what what helped you become the thinker that you are now and the critic that you are now? I don't know. I mean, I love reading. I've always loved reading. Um, I like having conversations with people. I don't I don't consider myself an intellectual, like just, I couldn't even think of the name of this person that uh, the, the one of two people whose names I was trying to call to mind. I, I just, I like thinking, I like understanding things for myself. I like putting, pulling things together and making new meanings. And, and I just feel like a lot of explanations for the world don't ring true to me. So I, I like thinking about the world from my, from, from scratch. Um, I don't think that I, I'm not an academic, you know, I'm, I'm right. just an imaginative, curious person. Yes. I think that's, that's the strength of your writing is being maybe a little bit outside the academic world and bringing these things in and juxtaposing them in, in ways that nobody's ever done before. Um, it's remarkable. And so, so inspiring could you tell us maybe what you love most about being a writer, about living this life that you've chosen? I just, I, I like the freedom. Um, I like, you know, I was just talking to, a, well, the person who's adapting my book for Hulu and, you know, she has to get notes from everybody before she can move on to the next step, you know, but when you're a novelist, you really can do anything you want. You have total freedom um, in putting your mind down on the page. And I, I like that there are certain people that read your books that um, write to you and tell you what they thought of it. I, I like the friendships that I've made with other writers. Um, I like being able to sort of spend the day at home. Though lots of people more <laughs> can do that now since the pandemic, but I've, I've really always loved being at home more than I like being anywhere else. So I, I just, I, I like wasting time in some way, like um, just being able to sort of, uh, yeah, I somehow managed to finish books without a lot of um, sort of whipping myself, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a bit of a decadent person, I think, and I'm able to somehow get this kind of work done while still being somebody that, that likes to wild away the hours and <laughs> um, that just feels very lucky and fun. Yes, yes, I imagine it does. And it seems like you have a very um, rich and inspiring uh, community, both in the US and in Canada. And I know we have writers who are listening today, as well as readers. And um, I know that it's hard for a lot of writers to find their people, or they're writing in isolation. And so from the outside now, it seems like, yeah, you have just this wonderful writing life but perhaps that hasn't always been the case and maybe there was a time where you didn't have that and you struggled to find it and maybe there's something that you might offer up to those who are listening who wish they had some of what you have um well it's just always been friendship friendship has always been very important to me more important really even than romance and I think the things that are important to you, you just sort of seek out in all sorts of ways so I would, when I was younger, I would just, you know, and still today, like if I read something by another writer, either an essay online or a book, and I like it, I'll just write them and tell them because I think every writer wants to hear that. Um, if I, I travel, do that too. <laughs> you do that too? Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah I think it's really important. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, if I travel to another city, when I was younger, I used to go see art and now I just try to see people and meet people and um I don't know I just think you have to want it because you love people you know and I really love people but I especially love writers and um I just like writers because I find that they are thinking about things in their own way so they're interesting to talk to for that re for me for that reason I'm also interested in how people solve the difficult problems that attend writing a book and and how yeah. they solve differently for me. So there's so much that I, I want to talk to other writers and not just writers, but other artists about. Other artists as well? Or yeah, painters, filmmakers, because often you can get ideas for how to solve the problems that you're experiencing, you know, 
even if somebody's working in an entirely different medium, sometimes it's even easier because if I'm talking to another writer and they have a very different style or a very different intent with their books for me, then the things that they do don't really have anything. There's not, there's no help in that for me. Right. But you, it's easier to translate from dance or from music oh. or from theater or in, into books, I find. Because you can it, you can think of what they are saying more metaphorically rather than like, um, yeah, than either accepting it or rejecting it as a as one has to do when you're both talking about writing books, for example. Yes, I can see that, and you also seem to do some collaboration, at least in your children's books, with the illustrators. What is that process like? You know, I was I was interested because. Um, both self-help and children's lit literature are disparaged genres in a way. Um, and you you write children's books and I don't know if you would claim the term self-help, but you write that too. And they're disparaged, but they're also absolutely beloved and people return to them again and again and again. And uh, maybe you can talk about the process of collaborating with your illustrator and of writing the two children's books that you've written. Well, with children's books, I mean, with the last one that I wrote with Esme Shapiro, like I just wrote the story and sent it to her and, you know, she made the pictures. And then I, after she made the pictures, I sort of edited the text because if she said something in the picture, I didn't need to say it in the text. So it's a collaboration, but it's more like a relay, you know, kind of collaboration. Like I do my part, then she does her part, then I do my part. It's not this creating the world from scratch together. So it feels, it feels like a different kind of genre of collaboration in that sense but um no I mean I, I I would love to I think writing children's books I mean they stay in your mind forever I just recently was at my brother's house and I have a niece who's five and I found this book that I guess my brother had brought up from my mother's basement that had been so important to me at that age and I was looking at the pictures and I hadn't seen the pictures for years but I had obviously poured over them when I was young and they're they're the sympathy that I don't even know what that feeling is of, of seeing such familiar images like they make your mind they make you who you are in a way that it, when you're reading books as an adult they do to some extent but I think less and less with each year like a book that I read last year I might love but it's not going to form my cells you know the way it does when you're younger I know exactly what you mean and I could not wait when we had kids to read them the books that I loved as a child. In fact, I didn't wait long enough because, you know, you're so eager to share that with them yeah. before they're ready. And yeah, those books stay with us. Well, they're, I guess it's our formative years, right? But they stay with us at a deep, deep level. Yeah, yeah they're like the universe to you when you're a kid, like those picture books, because you don't see that much. At least I didn't see that much when I was little. You know, you see your block and your parents and the books. And so it's your kind of it's like the mountains or the stars. It's like such an elemental part of your world. When you or um, when you sent your story to your friend Esme, did you have an idea in your imagination of what her illustrations would look like? No. no. So that must have been so exciting to get them. Yeah, it really was. It really was. I I had no idea what to expect, but they were perfect. Yeah. yeah. Very How great. How yeah. great. Um, Oh, I have so many questions. All right, I'll try to choose. We don't have too, too much more time. Um, in your, You did an interview with Elena Ferrante some years ago, <clears throat> which I read uh, just recently. And you asked her about whether or not female writers would do well to have children. And I just loved her answer. She, she said, <laughs> what is better for a woman who wants to write, to have children or not to have them? I don't know. Living isn't only reading and writing, but reading and writing can have the force to claim our entire life. And I don't know if that's a good thing, but I don't know if it's a bad thing either. One has to deal personally with these issues. And I laughed when I read it because Ferrante is refusing to advise in any way. She's not going to be a fixer. She's just mm -hmm. saying you really have to figure this out for yourself. And I so appreciate it in motherhood, as I do in all your books, that you grapple with these questions and you look at things from all these different angles and you know I chose a very different path because we have three kids together and but it allowed me 
to glimpse sort of over the wall what what life might have been like on this other side and I I really really appreciate that you invite your readers to engage so deeply and to wrestle um, with these questions and to live examine lives and that you hold up your own life as an example so bravely and even when I argue with them um, argue with your texts uh, I appreciate maybe especially then um, oh my goodness we're already so I, I guess I will put that question aside because we're already to the point where we want to get our participants questions and I'll ask you one last question and then I'm going to jump in and look at all of the um, questions from the um, audience and start asking. So um, I guess I'll, I'll ask you for my last question. What have you been reading? Um, maybe three books that um, have deeply influenced you or if you could make everyone in the audience read them, what would they be? Um, what have you been reading now that uh, that really has affected you deeply? Um, well, there's so much. I, I, but I, I wrote down a list so I wouldn't be in the situation that I was in earlier. <laughs> I would <tell> you <laughs> okay. um, a novel that I read um, a few years ago that I really loved was Emile Zola's um, Germinal. Um, G E R M I N A L for anyone taking notes. Uh, it's about this sort of coal mining town, which doesn't didn't sound to me like a book that I would be interested in, but it's absolutely one of the most magnificent novels I've ever read. Mm. You can't believe how much detail he gets from, I think only having spent a f six weeks doing research in, in this town and the, the humanity of the, the characters and it's about capitalism and it's about love and it's about um, yeah, being poor and being a worker and revolution and, um, you know, it's, it's just incredible. I, for years, I always thought, well, Crime and Punishment is sort of the, the greatest novel I've ever read. I sort of thought that since I was a teenager, but I think Germinal is like kind of right up there for me too. Um, the other book wow. that I wanted to recommend, um, was, um, um, the Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis, which is a very interesting book. It's sort of in the form of letters between basically like a, a devil-ish, sort of like a, a worker in a worker for the devil and his nephew who's sort of becoming a, a worker for the devil. And it's sort of about how to tempt a Christian a, away from Christianity. And it's such a funny but very spiritually profound book it's amazing hmm. and it kind of makes you talking about self-help it, it it makes you see where your um weaknesses can lead to turning away from doing the more difficult things in life um and then the other book I taught this in this class that I that I um ran uh, for these students in Leipzig a couple summers ago, Sex in American Literature, and Gail Jones, G-A-Y-L, Gail Jones, um, uh, she's a terrific um, Black American writer. She just actually recently published another book for the first time, I think, in 25 years, but her book, Corregidora, C-O-R-R-E-G-I-D-O-R-E-D-I-O-R-A, <laughs> No, Corregidora. anyways, Corregidora. Um, it's it's a book about um this woman and her relationships and her relationship to her lineage. And it's one of the most powerful em, em, emotionally kind of wrenching and also beautiful books about um love and sex and art and 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 race and um yeah, like the legacies of slavery and and how that affects romantic relationships and and the idea of being a mother and and all sorts of things it's so those are my three recommendations hey I'm delighted because I haven't read any of them so that's fantastic okay, okay good so I'll just remind the audience that um, if you have questions you can type them into the chat and I will go through them and ask some of them um, I guess I have time for another question myself but please go ahead if you have questions oh, for sure. Northrop Fry that's who I was trying to figure oh. out earlier oh uh, for the critics yeah yes. from from his literary criticism um was also very important to me when I was younger I yes. kept thinking Harold Innes but 
Harold Innes was a different person. Yes, thank you. I'm excited. Um, I have started a, a book group and it's a very fun group because we read two books that talk to each other in some way. And um, anyway, I will add these to my list. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you read and uh, do you read with any kind of order, which is how I wish I read? Like, do you read thematically or do you read the things that cross your de desk or, or what people tell you to read or... Uh, is there any rhyme or reason to it's very it's very there's no rhyme or reason to it I don't think there's any order or any plan um I put down books halfway through often I don't feel obsessive about finishing books um yeah I don't know I my attention is very quick so I I can't, you know, I, 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 I always have these thoughts like, oh, I want to read all of Iris Murdoch. I, I want to read all of this certain author. And I just, I never end up doing that except for Zola. I, I did spend like a year or two just sort of reading Emil Zola because each one of his books is so different from the other and they're all so fantastic. So. Yeah. Yes. That sounds like a very good thing. I've uh, wanted to have the discipline to read all of, you know, a certain country's literature, but <clears throat> I always get interrupted by other books. So I'm going to jump to some of the questions now. Um, let's see. So what is your take on the current cultural war regarding, oh my gosh, identity politics? You can pass on anything, as I said, if it doesn't spark joy. <laughs> um, what does your writing process look like? I'd be interested in if either of those, if you'd like to speak to either of those. I mean, I don't really have a take. I just, I, 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 I think why I find these debates interesting is because I, I think all sides have have their points. You know, I, I, I think identity is important because it is worthwhile to think about how the world treats people from, pe treats people differently based on their identities, and then it can also go too far where we forget our common humanity. Um, so I, I think that there's. I don't have a take. I think that it's, but it's interesting to 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 see what. Um, I mean, I I think having a take necessarily means leaving out certain truths. Um, there can't really be a a good final take. You know, I I I just wish that people listen to each other better in these in these debates but I, I think what's exciting about them is that people don't listen also I mean I think that's where the the drama comes from them that's where the energy comes as a, as a witness to them I don't I don't think it's helpful I don't think it's good but it's um um I wonder if it's necessary just as the bear and the bird and the fish are necessary to have this kind of conflict at times I think so yeah I think that's that's probably correct um writing process what's my writing process like I don't really have again a systematic way of going about it right now I'm not writing I'm just sort of thinking and fretting um but I think that's part of the writing process and 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 wondering if I'm ever going to finish this book that I'm working on or if it was like ill ill-fated and I, I shouldn't have started and I don't know I think that I think that every book is different. Every book has its own problems. You you don't really, you, there's, there's certain things you learn as you go along and then there's huge things that you always don't know. Um, I I know writers that do work every day. I'm not like that. I, I kind of feel like every day has the most important thing that needs to be done and it's not always writing. Um, yeah. But I, I just write a lot. I take a lot of notes. I read a lot. I think a lot. And then I kind of, um, I like to put everything in this like one document and make this sort of big massive brain that is the book's brain and then from there try to figure out well what might be like a narrative thread running through that or and also cutting like cutting is very important because there's so much writing that you do that's just not good and I'm not I'm not very precious like I don't need to keep things around just because I've read them uh, written them Yes. And I think that state of fretting that you're talking about is so important because you can't write till you've done the thinking or the fretting. They're, they're connected. And yeah, it's not very comfortable, but so necessary, I think. Mm -hmm. 
So I have a, a couple more questions I think that we have time for. This one asks, um, at the beginning of Pure Color, we watch an art critic destroy Manet for his asparagus painting. He's the reason we hate critics, so pompous, so needy to shine above the artist. I do understand that the present version of creation failed and that critics are needed to design a better one. Mira loves the asparagus painting. Would you talk a bit about the tension here? So I can repeat that if you'd like. Yeah, the tension. I mean, what's the tension? That people don't like the same things you like? Mm. Um, or that they refuse to love them? <laughs> like they refuse to love or like the same things that you love and like? Um, are well, unwilling they disparage to them, maybe. Pardon? Well, I mean, uh, the the caricature of a critic is that they, it's so much easier to destroy than to create. Yeah. I mean, I think for critics, destroying is a kind of creation because it 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 I would it makes space for the things that the critic loves. So huh. to destroy something is to create space for the art they love. So I don't think it's I think it's a productive destruction by their sites. Um, Oh my God, you just blew my mind. <laughs> I'm thinking about the just the you know the first drafts of creation in pure color and getting ready to destroy this creation. And wow, a destructive creation. I have never thought of criticism like that. I think so. And I I think that um also maybe it's it's worth saying that like I actually personally think that the art, the people that love the work are the, always the ones that are right about it. I think if there is anybody that loves the work, if 99 people hate it and one person loves it, that person is right. Yeah. Um, because I really do think that most artworks probably don't speak to any, everybody and aren't, aren't meant to and aren't supposed to. And, and even, and, and so it's, but if it speaks to one person, then it then it's it's captured something beautiful and real. And um, I mean, I love reading pans. I love reading takedowns. I find, again like this. Call, I just find it interesting to. St I, I I get a delicious kind of feeling of reading them, but I don't think they're right. You know, I think they're always they're always wrong. Unless unless I also hate the book, and then I think they're right. But I also <laughs> think that I'm I'm probably wrong if I can't see what's good about it. That's a beautiful answer. Thank you. Um, here's another question. Of, uh, how much of your writing comes from the subconscious? And you maybe you answered that a little bit about the fretting and the worrying. But this this um, audience member asks, how many of you, are your ideas pure from brain to page? Or are they polished for an audience? Do you write for yourself or for an audience? both I guess and I am an audience and other people are myself you know like we're all one self so um I guess it's there's really no difference between writing for yourself and writing for an audience or writing for an audience and writing for yourself um a, a lot of my ideas do come from dreams you know so I think that I can definitely say that the subconscious is involved when you're writing and you're conscious you're sitting down and writing it's hard to say whether those ideas are coming from the con your conscious mind or your subconscious mind or where, but um, I I think the subconscious really is what leads leads you through to the end. It helps you figure out the form. There's nothing very rational about writing a piece of fiction, and fiction doesn't work on us rationally. It works on us and symbolically and metaphorically, and I I think those associations probably do come from the part of your mind that's that's not quite um reasoning things out that's just following intuition and and yeah yes I would think so yeah um so I have a, a question as I was reading uh, your interview with Ferrante and thinking about um Mira's relationship with Annie in the book um even though you and Elena Ferrante are such different writers you both are so um, preoccupied with and write so beautifully about uh, powerful female friendships between straightish women where the female friendships are primary in a life. And I was wondering if you could talk about that um, in Pure Color. I see it in, in some of your other books as well. And because you mentioned friendship is, is 
a guiding force in your own life? Um, I just, I think that's where the best conversations happen often um, in the context of female friendship um, and where there's love and trust. And, um, you know, there's, there's a lot in life that, can only be spoken about with a friend that you can't really speak about with your with people that are farther from friendship and or that are closer you know that are lovers um and there's something about a friendship where you don't where there's not really a contract um it's just purely elective and and there's something about those kind of relationships that allow for a certain degree of um, intimacy that, you know, in a romantic relationship, which often implies a contract, there there can't be quite that degree of intimacy because sometimes too much intimacy can threaten, threaten that agreement. Um, so I guess that's why I like it. And I, I just think women have a lot to talk to each other about in terms of... The, their lives and the, the situation they find themselves in and, and, and working out what the right thing to do is and working out what feels good and what doesn't feel good. And what's, I don't know, there's just a lot to figure out. There's so much. And I like what you're saying about intimacy and lovers can be almost too, too intimate. They're, they're too close too too much like bears, you know, and, um, but female friendship, you're at the right distance, maybe to have yeah. those conversations. Yeah. yeah and I don't even think that like, like true love between lovers is really about talking for me. It's about other, it's about sharing a space or being in the same space together, lovingly mm -hmm. and comfortably and sort of being beside each other. Whereas friendship to me is really a place of working something out, thinking it's a place, it's about thinking. I love that. Hmm. And yet with Mira and Annie, um, their their friendship is not static at all they they are so close there it's almost this erotic charge between them at at times and then um, they have breaks in their friendship they save each other things things do not stay the same throughout the book and I think that's very true and well written um, true true to my experience and well written so thank you for that mm -hmm. Oh, goodness. Maybe we have time for one last, last quick question. Hmm. Um, let's see. I wonder if you could talk. So I, um, I was reading some of the critics um, who have spoken about pure color and <clears throat> they just love it and they find so much um, wisdom in it. So Perul Segal in The New Yorker wrote, uh, and I quote, Hetty's books aim to be vessels for the transformation of reader and writer. And Vulture magazine said, would it be déclassé to say this funny and moving novel about a grieving daughter cling clinging to beauty uh, to dull or even transcend the pain of loss is both precious and practical, that it could help you? Maybe so, but who cares? The reward of pure color is that you could actually emerge feeling better. So I think for the last question I will, I will ask you today is, what would you like your books to be for your readers? Do you, would you like them to feel better? Do you want to offer them up as vessels of transformation? How should a person read Sheila Hetty? What would you like us to take away? The, speaking about the subconscious I mean the first answer that came to me halfway through that question was like I want the books to be a place um I just want it to be a place that the reader is in like a new place um sort of like a, so I don't think that that's necessarily about feeling better and it's also not about following a story it's, you know, and, and with this new book that I'm thinking about writing, the main thing that I can see in it is something about the smell and the colors and the texture of the place that it's located. Like, I don't mean this place that it's located, like in the house, but just 
books all create places that for you to be, you go in and there's this space that it creates based on the characters and the way that the writing happens and the, the emotional tone. It's a, it's a place that's different from your life. So that's all I really think that I want the books to be. It's a different space to inhabit. Um, I don't think it, I don't think it, I think everything else is kind of secondary. I love that. Well, um, thank you for giving us this wonderful place to inhabit that is pure color. And um, yeah, I know that it will stay with me. So thank you. I'm very grateful for it. And what a thank wonderful you. conversation. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And thanks thanks to all the audience for their questions and, and Daphna for having me. And yeah. Yay. Well, thank you both. And, and what, a, what a fabulous place to leave it off to thinking about the places um that the novels take you that you then you know have to inhabit um so thank you both so much for your generosity and, and your honesty and thank you all for joining us as well i hope you enjoyed hearing from rachel and sheila as much as i did i was quite enthralled for the hour um if you do know anybody who happened to miss this wonderful interview it will be available on our youtube channel just a little bit later in the week and please join us in about three weeks on May 2nd to hear author Jill Adamson interview Brian Thomas Isaac about his long listed novel, All the Quiet Places. So if you've subscribed to our mailing list, you'll get a notification. If not, just check out our website and have um, a wonderful evening. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.